Welcome back to the Monty and Wolf show where we focus on everything LCK and Wolf. What a what a joyous week this was with absolutely no drama, no controversy, no messed up things happening in the oh wait. Well, I guess we should talk about Faker. And uh, I don't know, Wolf, you're our resident uh, StarCraft II Pro League champion, apparently, 2012-2013. Was that the one that KT won? Not uh, STX. Oh, STX won. Was it 2014 um, that KT won? KT won 2014, yeah. That, I was at that final, I remember. Yeah, it was a really good final. Um, <laughs> it was very fun. It was in the middle of the river. <laughs> yeah, and... Um, I don't know there was a lot of there was a lot of memory like flashes like writing people's names on soccer balls and then kicking them and out kicking into the river. Into the river that was fun. Yeah, yeah I hope somebody <laughs> cleaned those up. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a really fun finals. I don't know. I I got this hat. Kenzie sometimes finds like old esports uh, memorabilia and, and sends them to me. Um, so this is like this is the hybrid uh, StarCraft One StarCraft Two Pro League that. Uh, oh yeah. Um. And uh, like, see, if someone had an old STX, you know, when you win Pro League or win LCK, like they have the shirts pre-made where you're like champions. I always yeah, wonder yeah. what happens to the teams that lose the finals. What happens to their shirts that say champions on them that they didn't get to wear because they didn't win? But STX did they're win. Shot, they're they're shot on a cannon in the North Korea. Um, <laughs> that's, I mean, maybe that's yeah, that could be what happens. Uh, so let's talk about let's talk about Faker because. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of information going around, a lot of, um, uh, clips, obviously the clip is the big one. There's, I've seen a lot of people's takes. I saw a double lifts take, uh, yesterday. I've seen a lot of people talk oh, about very it. valuable double lifts take as always, as always. I mean, people, people are, people people have, have, people have their takes, right? There's a lot of there, any take that has a lot of views is going to affect how people think about this type of situation. Right. And, um, there's no denying that it was not not a good series for Faker uh, against Genji. Um, he had some really poor positioning on Corky. He failed a Valkyrie over the wall. He got picked in top lane um, when he was overextended. He Valkyried into that mid fight, which um, you know, again, like he's cut off from his team. He wants to rejoin. Like I, this is why I literally said this on the cast. Like he wants to rejoin the fight as soon as possible because if he's not there and they they actually win the fight 5v4 for those extra moments, then, like, they lose the fight. But Valkyrie in there was definitely not it. Um, it was definitely not the right call, not the right play. And so, I mean, I, I looked at that moment, and it seemed to me as though um, what, what what actually happened was that they had coordinated an, an engage, and that engage was going to be carry a flash not ulting Zeri, and Faker was going in to help burst Zeri, and what happened was the Nautilus got Callista ulted back into the team, and so he kept going in. Um, so it was a mistake for sure. And there was, I think, time to adjust that. But to me, it really looked like a play that they had set up that changed when the Callista ult was used. So it, it, it felt like a team fail to me. Yeah, either way, like, you know, the decision to Valkyrie in there ends up being very easily punishable. Um, and D plus lock him down and kill him very quickly. It was a fairly disjointed fight for T1, but they had lost control of the game. They lost control of the map a little bit at that point. So, um it's 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 one of those moments where it certainly looks bad. It looks like a big fail, but also owner had a big fail, you know, on the dragon moments before that. It was a game where they had full control. They had a comp that needed to snowball. They snowballed it, and then they just kind of fell apart. Um, and it's a really frustrating game to lose. And then it's after that game one that a fan in the audience, which nobody, I don't think, has really identified who this fan is, but it seems to be a Chinese fan because they uploaded its Chinese social media first. Is what I this is the story that I know. Um, and then, of course, it started to spread. It was spreading internally um, amongst uh, a lot of the LCK staff. People were really stressed out, like about the fact this video was being shared, just simply because it's uh, a very... what the video. What the video was. So, what part? But like, we can actually get the facts because you're in the arena. So, what happened, as Wolf was saying, was after game one, it looked like Faker was really frustrated. A fan took a video, and what the video shows is Faker kind of like, I, I wouldn't say slamming but like hitting his head against the wall in a way that probably hurt but wouldn't like give him a concussion uh was my kind of evaluation of it it also like the wall to me doesn't look 
that hard. I don't know what that's. Do you know what substance that wall oh, is made out of? Because it's not like brick or anything. It looks like it was drywall or like a covering or something like that. I think it's a covering. Like I, if I'm not even mistaken, I, I don't have the video open right now, but I think it's like a, a wall is covered by like sponsor stuff. So it's got that. Yes. like uh It's got the um, you know, big logos and stuff on it, and that type of material yes. is usually pretty thick. Um, yes. And um. I wouldn't say it's like shock absorbent, but it's definitely not hitting your head into wood or brick or or concrete right. or, or anything like yes. that. Um, although, you know, that being said, I, I don't think it would feel very good to hit your head into it, especially if you watch the video, you can see that the, the way you could tell the level of impact is by watching Faker's hair, actually, um, in the video. Yeah, he's hitting his head pretty hard. He's hitting his head pretty hard. And um, I, I think the, the most... The thing that really struck me about the video was, in terms of just the, the video itself, was that um, a few of the people on T1 just, like, do see it happen and initially don't do anything for a few seconds until Guma, you know, kind of, I think, comes to and, and grabs him and is like, whoa, like, you know, stop that. Um, and yeah, Guma basically like, grabs him by the shoulders and pulls him away from the yeah. wall in the video. I mean, some people have speculated because of T1's otherwise lukewarm reaction until that moment that maybe this has happened before. Um, I think people are just talking about the loss and probably don't really understand what's going on. Guys, it takes a minute to respond to that kind of thing, especially yeah. if you find it out of place or shocking. So yeah, I wouldn't no, I, read too much into that. I wouldn't either. And I think um, I think everybody else is, for the most part, focused on the, the replay that Coma is going over. And we don't know what they're discussing in that moment in the room. Um but it, it might have been something like Faker, you know, realized again, like he Faker knows he he had a bad game. Like every everybody knows that he knows it, but maybe they're like reviewing it and it just really gets into his head more and he gets super frustrated in that moment. Um and and that's why that happens. But Guma ends up being a good friend and teammate and, and pulls him off of it, right? Um in, in my opinion, this is a sign of somebody who is a perfectionist, somebody who puts a lot of pressure on himself, puts a lot of pressure on himself, you know, daily to compete and to be at the highest level and has for over a decade and has found himself, I think, the, the I don't want to say victim, but the target of a lot of online hatred because of his recent form this year, his form at MSI. Um, and he's been the greatest of all time, the best in the world, right, for so long. And he's he's carried that weight and that responsibility that comes with that and also has the biggest fan base in the world and then by proxy the biggest hate haters in the world the biggest group of haters um and he's kind of been dealing with that both online in korea and um overseas um is is this narrative of like faker's time has passed you know he's he's bad now he can't play tristana and stuff like that um and then he and he's been accused of being bad on quirky as well and then he had a bad quirky game and um, I think that all of this is kind of building up to like T1 trying to get back into top two, which had they won this series would have been possible. I don't think it's going to be possible now, but obviously they have a weak strength of schedule left so they can get top three and they've yep. done deep playoff runs in the past where that, that actually ramps them they up. They won Esports World Cup, which is yeah. like, obviously not, it's not a super big accomplishment, but it wasn't nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they beat the international competition there. So uh, and and Team Liquid was looking really good and almost almost beat them right, but they were able to hold it together. Uh, I do feel like this is not a sign of like Faker is needs to retire or Faker is is burnt out. I think a lot of people are blaming burnout here. I think it's just his recent form and his frustration with that because of him being a perfectionist because he it has been so good. Um, they just lost composure. I think that's the saddest thing for everybody is because we kind of view Faker as like he's a he's a perfect being, like he's a robot, like he's been so good for so long, he can almost be infallible. And then when you see him in interviews and stuff, he hardly ever stumbles. He hardly ever throws anybody under the bus. He's overall a super realistic and super positive person about himself and others and his, his teammates and people around him. Doesn't put others down. You know, he's very much the guy who is as close to a genuinely perfect pro gamer that you could ever see yeah. across. Like he's basically the nicest and most well put together person who's ever yes. touched a mouse and keyboard. And so when and, you see and, this, and you're the like, way, guys, this, this, this isn't an act either. Like I've known, you know, I interacted with Faker. I'm sure you interact with Faker Wolf. Like I interacted with Faker like multiple times a week for years. Um, when I was casting an LCK, he was incredibly polite to me. 
knew everybody's name. Um, he talks and he was talking English to me regularly. So English is actually quite good because he wanted to practice. Um, he went out of his way to like have conversations. His family is super nice. Like I used to hang out with his dad and his his aunts at, at the events because they always show up to support him. We're very talkative uh, with me and with my wife. Um, he's just like he's a very chill guy. Like, honestly, what you see is exactly who he is. Yeah, and I think that's why it was so jarring to me and to everybody else when that video surfaced and we all saw it, um, because it it's just so unlike what you expect from somebody who always has it together on camera, especially, you know? Um, and I think that was a, a really... I don't even know. It's hard to describe it in words, but it was a moment where everybody was like, oh, he is human. You know, he he humanized himself in this moment. And, and it wasn't meant to be seen by the rest of the world. But, you know, you are in a transparent glass booth with the with the coaching staff. So anyone in the audience could have seen that. I think he was definitely I'm not saying he did on purpose. But I'm saying like he he might have been aware of that, but didn't in the moment think about the fact that somebody might share this and put it on the Internet. I don't think he uh, wanted that to be seen by everybody. But sure, yeah, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it was, and I think the response has been very mixed online about, about this, but I think most people realize that, you know, this person is under an insane amount of pressure. And as a result of that, like, you know, maybe like there's, there's been an overwhelming feeling of people saying that maybe some, something needs to change in this, in this team environment. Maybe Faker is working too much. He's doing too many events. He's doing too many ads. He's doing too much stuff. Um, I think that Faker probably would be disappointed to hear people say that. I think Faker probably doesn't want to step <laughs> back. I think Faker doesn't. Yeah. A lot of people are saying like Poby needs to come in for a week or two. I think that no. that kind of comment is like what will make Faker unhappy because he wants to be able to show up for you guys. He wants to be able to play for you guys. He wants to not disappoint you guys. And I guarantee you he's probably going to grind super hard and also grind on his mental, like work on his mental health over the next few days before he plays his next games next week. Got easier opponents for T1. The, the toughest one left is B and K. The rest of them are super easy. I think he's going to show up next week and and be in a good mindset and um and will will play well. I don't think he'll be subbed out. I just don't see that well, happening. It, it's I think it's also just an, a lack of understanding of Faker's competitive drive. Like anybody who has survived as long as Faker and been as good as Faker is going to be obviously highly competitive, and that can come out in terms of aggression, right, guys? Like this is this is one of those weird times where, you know, we don't have insight all the time into professional athletes when they're practicing, but we do get streams of professional players. Right. Um, they, they do get banned from the solo queue ladder because they are talking shit in a way that they that pro athletes probably talk shit when they're practicing. Right. It's just recorded and put out there for everybody to see. And so it's not surprising, like Faker probably does get angry, like w literally what highly competitive person doesn't get frustrated and angry when they are performing poorly or when other people around them are performing poorly, that they're relying on as teammates. This is very common guys. And like, obviously it's disturbing in terms of his self-destructive behavior. Um, and, but I don't think that benching him or, ha you know, he's not to be treated in the same way that somebody else is who is less competitive. Like he's not going to bench himself. That's yeah. not a thing that's going to happen. If anything, this is fuel for the fire. Does he need to find better ways probably to, you know, have this this outburst take place? Yes. Like harming himself is not great, um, but his frustration is understandable. And you guys, you can't you can't disentangle that aspect of Faker's personality that you saw from why he is the greatest player in League of Legends history. Like those two things are linked, whether you like it or not. Um, that's just how competitive people are. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot of um, angry scenes from pro players over the years. Oh, yeah. Throwing their keyboards, headsets, slamming their fists on the table, knocking stuff over. Um, I mean, we've even seen altercations between pro gamers, not very often in League of Legends, but, you know, in other games we have seen that. Um, I think the overarching point that you made about players being, you know, having some anger and frustration because of, the, the competitive nature of thousands of people watching you and you have to perform and that's how you're going to get your salary for next year and all this stuff is very true. And um, I think it's also 
weirdly enough, a, a sign of how much they care and how passionate they are about the game. Of course! And I, I think, like, this is Faker's way of, you know, not to, not to the fans and not necessarily to his teammates, but this was in that moment Faker's way of trying to like steady himself and be like, you fucked up, man, but, with, but it's going to be okay. Like, you know, I feel like that might be like what was happening there. He just felt insane frustration. Yes. And everybody has a, a moment in their lives. I mean, maybe even every week where you, you do something and you th think you made the right choice and it clearly backfires and you go to the bathroom or something, you wash your face and you, sometimes you might even say out loud to yourself or you say it to yourself in your head, you're like, you fucked up. <laughs> you know, there's, <laughs> there's been more than, there's been more than one time this week where I would have told myself, well, if you fucked up there, <laughs> you know? And I think that it, when you have millions of people watching you and 500 people in the live audience watching you and screaming and cheering and hoping that you're going to do it and then you Valkyrie in and, and die. Well, especially because this is a very important game, too. It's I mean, this important. is the game. Like, like you put yourself in Faker's situation, guys. What, you've lost nine times in a row to Gen G? Has that ever happened to Faker before with any team ever? Two no. Teams. Two teams, actually. Well, it's, no, not nine, but seven times was like the record before that where, where he had uh, Damwon um, and then yes. King Zone, I think it was. Um, yeah, it was the only two teams that ever had like that close to a record, but like Gen G's is going up to, to 10 now. Um, yeah, so like, uh, it, it's it's crazy though, right now. I mean, this guy's lost two consecutive it. finals to this, to this team. Like, you know, he's had such a successful career, and I'm sure that winning worlds, you know, was a balm on his wounds in some ways, and winning esports World Cup, I'm sure, was meaningful in some kind of way. But it is very frustrating because it just feels like I'm sure for them that Gen G, with this roster at least, is the team that is just impossible to overcome. And it and I think it doesn't probably help Faker in that the main player on the enemy team is in like the most famous and iconic player who's trying to eclipse his legacy is in his lane. Um and laning against him yeah. and crushing him in lane. And then he's also going into this these team fights later on where he's somewhat at a deficit in terms of his laning. Um sometimes down on items against this guy when he does show up for team fights every time is forced to use his TP, oftentimes so it doesn't have that tool um they would otherwise have against other teams. And it's the guy like when he looks across the stage and he sees the guy, it's Chovy, it's the guy that people are saying has is, you know, is potentially gonna pass Faker's legacy one day. Yep. Um and that's that's frustrating, you know. And that's, he's been and Faker has been injured, so I'm sure he. So, like, if you actually stack up all the factors here, guys, it's actually crazy. So, first off, I said this on Summoning Insight, but if you actually just think about the amount of time T1 has been playing League with this five man roster over the past two years, it is nuts. Like, they have literally played more games of League of Legends and had to play longer because they've gone deeper in tournaments than Gen G has. And the reason is, is because. Guess what, guys? They've made every LCK final. Oh, they've made two Worlds finals, which means they played the maximum amount of days at Worlds. They won one, lost one. Uh, they've made deep runs at MSIs, right? Um, they made the final MSI. Um, Esports World Cup. And guys, they had to go to the Red Bull Battlegrounds in Paris, in France, this offseason. So they didn't even get an offseason. They literally played until the final day of Worlds, won Worlds, and then didn't get a break. Like, it is crazy how much this team has been playing. And then on top of that, oh, what's that? They can't practice in solo queue for months now. I don't even know if this issue has been solved because of the DDoSing problem. So that's been a, a huge, uh, you know, frustration. Faker's had his injury problems where he had to go out last summer. Um, we don't know if that injury is still plaguing him or not. It seems like it definitely could be considering his performance. But if, you, if you're Faker and you have a combination of like we say, the lost streak to Gen G, the threat to your legacy, um, the the injury that you've been dealing with, and you can't practice these champions, and and you get the criticism on top of that because he, while he performed, I think, very well in spring, he has been struggling in this meta this summer, and certainly if he his injury is is bothering him, or the DDoS is still affecting him, it feels like he's not. It's not even fair. You know, he can't even overcome the practice, you know, issues that he might be having. He might not be able to practice in the way that he wants to right now um, to get better. And so that's, that really fucking sucks. Um, and I understand, again, not the best way. Don't take it out on yourself physically. Like, that's a bad way to deal with this problem. But I think it's understandable why this happened. Absolutely. And 
you know, with all the ads and stuff he has to do on top of that crazy schedule you mentioned, oh, yeah. it's just, it's a lot. Um, it's hard to rest, and when you get to that point, um, you know, a lot of Korean celebrities have, have given interviews and talked about this, like some of the top most famous Korean celebrities, TV, sports athletes. When you get to that point of um, of being like, I am the top of this industry, like I'm the best comedian, I'm the best pro gamer, or whatever. Um, yeah. You, your mentality changes to not from like just wanting to win or just wanting to get the best career, but then being like, okay, well now I need to make sure my fans are happy. Like you, something clicks in your brain once you, when you get to the top and you're the best, you still want to perform, right? You still want to have a great career, but it becomes less about you because you've already accomplished the thing. Like you kind of already won. Um, you know, it's like if you get elected president, like now you're like, okay, well, I won, but like now let's see what I can do for the people. You know, I think it's often like a, a politician's view of like what, they, what you could think about this, like, but the um, the way that Faker, I think, looks at his fans, the way that he um, plays the game, when he loses, he's frustrated himself, but he knows he lets so many people down. I think that's like a mentality that he has. And based on his interviews and stuff you've seen from over the last decade, I think he really does feel like part of why he still plays the game and he could have retired a long time ago. I mean, yes, he's making a ton of money, but like he has a ton of money already. Um, I think part of why he still plays is because he wants to, to keep that, that fandom happy. He wants to keep league of legends alive. I mean, without him, like, you know, it, the, the, the viewership definitely will go down, right? Like he is the, the biggest, most iconic person in league. And when he steps onto the rift, when he, when he actually shows up and sits on the stage, viewership explodes, whether it's at MSI Worlds, uh, LCK, or just a show match somewhere, you know, his, his importance to League of Legends is massive, and I think he's aware of that as well, and he wants to just perform the best for everybody. He doesn't want to retire. He doesn't want to be forced out by a bunch of haters on the internet. He also doesn't need to retire. I mean, it's not like he has no value. No, guys. He's, he's still he's, like he's... a top three mid laner in the LCK. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, you know, certainly, and also there are his measurable more measurable skills in terms of his individual ability but we've also seen what this team looks like without him on it and they have no shot calling like his he may not be the individual mechanical player that he used to be or individual player with the largest champion pool like he used to be but he has valuable skills in terms of shot calling and in-game leadership that we we know what happens when he leaves this roster it's a fucking disaster um so you know, this team has been well constructed with a veteran player in Faker who can do his job quite well, oftentimes, uh, even if this meta isn't his. And like this, we all know this meta isn't going to last, guys. Like they don't, Riot obviously doesn't want double 80 carry meta forever. They don't want that. Let's be real. Yeah. Um, that's never been the way they've balanced the game. And it's not going to be the way they start balancing the game now. You see the nerfs coming in, the nerfs will continue. I'm not concerned about that. Um, it will tilt back into Faker's wheelhouse eventually. Uh, and just because this ain't his meta and because he is an older player now and is limited in certain ways doesn't mean that he hasn't developed very impressively other valuable skills. So I don't know. I, I think I think we will see him come back in a big way next week. I think he will look good and that'll be the end of it. Now, I suppose because T1's been pretty silent on the issue, you know, this is kind of my final thoughts on this, is, is I feel like since T1 has been completely silent on the issue, there's Which a chance they could... Which is by the way. Which yeah, is outrageous. Yeah, they, there's a chance that they're brewing on potentially, you know, making the statement be that he's going to take a week off. Um, I think that they're trying to figure out the PR optics of this. I know that's definitely not what Faker wants, and I don't think he will allow it, um, just simply because he knows he underperformed, but taking time off might actually, in my opinion, hurt his mental health more uh, and frustrate him more if he's kind of forced to, to take a, 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 some time off, especially if Poby sure. is playing and his team is struggling like what happened last time. So I, I don't know what T1 is going to say. I feel like they will say something because they've been so silent since the incident. Um, but I think he's just going to come back next week and he's going to look better and T1's going to have their playoffs run Will they make it all the way to the finals this time? It's tough to say. You know, we'll be talking about that in a few weeks' time. But um, I think T1 is primed to, at their best, they should be able to beat Hanwha and D+. Like, I'm not saying that's going to that's a guarantee, but I think they can do it now. Whereas a few weeks ago, I was like, no, there's no way this team is really struggling right now. I think they're kind of back. 
And the fact that they almost beat Genji in that first game should tell you that this team actually can go toe to toe with anyone. Yeah, they messed it up at the end of the day, but had they not messed it up, they would have won that game. And then maybe your mentality is better going into game two. Anything could happen there. The truth is, they fucked it up though, Monty. And Genji won that series. And it looks like Genji is going to go undefeated. And they might even get the plus 35 game score. They're not going to get the perfect plus 36, but if they beat Hanwa 2 0. Damn you, Dom 1. <laughs> if they beat Hanwa 2 0, um, then they can get the plus 35 because the rest of their opponents are really weak. And weirdly enough, Monty, I'm happy that they don't get the plus 36 because it means that there's always, like, every season there's a team that could do it in theory, right? Like, in, until that That's record no, actually is hit. That is so crazy. I mean, I can't imagine that would ever actually happen. Because, like, once somebody gets the perfect record, no one can do better than that, right? Like, it's like, okay, if somebody could tie that perfect record that Genji had. Oh, but then you go perfect through playoffs too, Wolf. Come on. I guess that's true. <laughs> and then you go perfect the whole year. Don't look at it that way. All right. Well, I'm just talking about regular season, all right? Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if anyone beats this team. It's crazy. And to me, when I compare it to um, T1's perfect season that we had a few years back, with the carrier playing the, the marksman supports and stuff like that. To me, this feels more impressive. I know if you guys look back at like the stuff I said back then, I was actually going like, this is the craziest, and like they're so good, and they're so dominant, yeah, and, they, and they were. But this feels more impressive to me at this point because it's not just meta abuse. You know, like, Karia was playing champions that no one else played, that everyone copied him, and that everyone found that it was really good, and everyone emulated T1. But not only are Genji just playing what everyone else is playing is very standard, but they've also shown that Canyon can play carries and be like the first great Zyra player, but he can also play tanks. It doesn't matter. Keen's champion pool is huge. Chovy's played a bunch of different stuff. Um, he's played mostly Corky, but he's played a few other champions like very well, right? A very wide array of styles of champions. Um, and then Pays on the hands of like really leveled up and they're playing incredibly well on the the strong meta champions. They're not just going, I'm I figured this out first, I'm better than everyone else because I figured this out and practiced this before everyone else. I don't like taking anything away from T1's era where they did that because they also played some other more meta comps. Uh, but Genji is just by far the best at this meta, but can also do other shit. And that's that's why I'm leaning towards for me. This is more has been more impressive. I also look at the um, the rise that D Plus have had, and Hanwha have had, and T1 is still a competitive team. It feels like it's it was a tougher season to accomplish this in if they do it for Genji this time around. Um, whereas back in that spring season, it's spring season, it's not as, um, the bet is not as figured out, people's teams and rosters aren't as figured out, I don't feel like that was a particularly strong year of, of regular season for the LCK, um, and Genji are playing against some of the best, like, Zeka in a good meta for him, for example, you know, that, that kind of thing, um, and that's what's hype about it to me, and it almost feels like the LCK has been trivialized by this team, <laughs> because they just, <laughs> it's just so one-sided, like, their average gold difference before that series i looked it up um at 15 minutes was like 2300 2400 um in the lead at 15 minutes like on average that's just that's not that's not normal that's not supposed to happen like, that's not that's <laughs> not those numbers aren't okay <laughs> monty <laughs> all right i i do want to talk about genji a little bit more but first guys we have a sponsor and that is raycon here you go you're the Raycon everyday earbuds. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, Wolf has this right there too. Very good. Um, so uh, these these Raycon everyday earbuds, very, very useful. The newest model, they're constantly iterating on these, but the newest model actually has active noise cancellation inside the earbuds, which is crazy. It's super effective. They also have the awareness mode, which obviously passes sound in around you, so you can tap them to switch between the modes. Really nice 32 hours of battery life with a quick charge functionality where 10 minutes of charging gets you 90 minutes of battery. So really good stuff, guys. Um, I've been using them, you know, at the gym because they're sweat resistant, water resistant on flights with the, the active noise cancellation. And these are a lot cheaper than other earbuds with similar features while still maintaining very high quality. So I would check them out. Also available in a lot of colors, if that's your thing. We have the black ones, obviously, but you can get them in all kinds of colors. You can go to buyraycon.com slash M and W. That's M as in Monty. Uh, Monty and Wolf, so M and W. Today, to get 20 to 40% off site-wide. So you get them for even cheaper. 
That's right, you'll get up to 40% off everything on Raycon's website when you go to buyraycon.com slash MNW, buyraycon.com slash MNW. How have you been enjoying them, Wolf? I've been enjoying them a lot. I use them to play, you know, my PS5. Um, I also use them when I'm traveling on public transportation in a taxi. Um, and the noise canceling is pretty useful when I'm in a loud place, um, where I often am when I'm waiting in a line, for example. Um, <laughs> and people are just being really loud around me. And I don't want to hear that. And I just want to hear my music <laughs> or, you know, whatever video I'm watching uh, or any Twitch stream I might be watching. Um, you're watching Monty and Wolf and people keep like around you just interrupting you. Just trying to noise, noise canceling. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, all right. So there you go, guys. Thank you. And of course, supporting our sponsors. It's the best way to support us here at Last Free Nation and on the Monty and Wolf show. So if you've been looking for some new earbuds, it's a great way to support us as well. Uh, all right. So Gen G, I do think like it's fun to talk about this team because they are still, you know, surging forward is possibly the greatest team of all time, depending on their performance the rest of the year, still on track for the Golden Road. No, you little posers. Esports World Cup doesn't count against the Golden Road. You are wrong. No. That's it. <laughs> uh, they play KT this next week. Uh, last match of the season, though, as you point out, Wolf, might be really what determines the undefeated season because literally the very last match of the very last week of the regular season is Hanwha Life versus Gen G. And Hanwha, you know, maybe not looking so hot right now. Uh, although, who knows how KT works. We'll get to that. Um, Gen G, though, really disposing of T1 coming back in that first game, as you noted earlier. They had excellent scaling with that composition. And uh, you fault owner because, yes, he was trying to clear the crab when they when they were heading into um, the spawn of the dragon soul. Um, so they're trying to get control over that area. But, you know, you may, you may trash owner. I choose Wolf to compliment Keen and his incredible gank that he got in the pixel brush. He laid a trap there for owner and surprised him. Also Keen completely shit on Zayas in the second game using a teleport exhaust top lane Cassante into Kennen which was an amazing performance by him. Again, Keen, he just does everything. Is he the best Cassante player in the world? Hell yes, he is. Has Cassante been nerfed? Yes, he has. Is Keen a playmaker? Does he just do his fucking job every game? Does he care about taking Flash in the top lane? No, he just takes exhausts and dumpsters dumpsters a cannon. Something I didn't even know could happen. Um, I love Keen. Yeah, Line picks the Cassante. Mwah. I think he's the second player to do that uh, exhaust um, instead of flash tech. It was like an east side weaker team that did it the first time. And actually, I don't think it worked for them. <laughs> but Kane pulled it off. I think Kane's the first person to actually win doing it. Um, so, and against a good team nonetheless. I'm loving how Kane is playing. Uh, I do think that the the draft in game one with the um, with the Senna, the Orin, right, is super scaling comp where Chovy played Zeri mid. That was a very greedy composition, but I trust a team like uh, Gen G to actually be able to scale to the late game and, and and relieve the pressure. They actually shook my trust a little bit because the the early game went very poorly for them because they had the scaling comp, but they they were still forcing fights and actually trying to be aggressive um, around objectives because I guess they thought if we can just delay these objectives, that'll buy us enough guaranteed time, which ultimately eventually did. But I was very worried for them, and I thought the I thought the game was lost for sure. Uh, but when you look at what the comp does with its insane double frontline Cassante Orin for, you know, 180 carry plus a Senna, because I don't like to call Senna 80 carry, but she just is um, long range damage and sustain in team fights. They also had the sustain from Canyon as well with his Nidalee. So it was a pretty insane comp. Like if you just look at those five champions and you go, okay, this went to late game, who do you think wins? And you don't even have to look at the other side. You're like, well, this one probably wins. It's insanely strong. Um, I thought it was a really creative draft. You know, I heard um, from talking to Arnold that there was definitely some uh, mixed opinions on that draft and people were not <laughs> not very happy with how it turned out. Like, it, it seemed way too greedy, uh, but they were able to win anyways, uh, despite it with, you know, you say a good play from Keen, I say some mistakes from Team 1. I think a little <laughs> bit of both, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, Genji, there's been so many games this season. By so many, I mean like three. There's been like three games this season where it's like, oh, it's another loss. Like Genji lost a game. It's happening, and then uh, they just clutch it out in the end and actually win it anyways, where they're significantly behind, and then make the right calls, find the punish, 
boom, back in the game. So I just like the team is losing. I mean, they're behind 3,000 gold, and then boom, I want a Baron fight, and then the game just ends. GG. You know what? You know what I love, though, is like, Gen G, sure, they got a bit too cocky at Esports World Cup, um, but, you know, and maybe they're getting a little too bored and too cocky now. You know, should we let Fear X have Rumble two games in a row? Sure. Keen plays the top rise. It's the Rumble counter, right? Uh, you know, they're they're clearly like... So that was a bit of trolling. Toy- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing a little bit of trolling. <laughs> I mean, I just love how they won that second game with the top rise when their entire top side of the map had zero kills. Literally, they had nine kills in that whole game. Fewer kills than Fear X. And eight of those nine kills were on Pays, and the last one was on Lehens. And his only purpose was denying the pentakill. So it really should have been nine kills on Pays. Pays literally should have had every kill in that game. <laughs> Keen Canyon and Joby just zero kill. It was a very troll game, guys, where uh, Fear X tries to do a Baron. Genji, like, comprehensively outplays them. Lehen steals a Pays Penta. It's very funny. I I feel like um, Zeri mid is so risky against, good, like, really good mid laners and, and junglers. Yeah, she has her dash, so she's somewhat, you know, she's somewhat mobile. Like, she can get out of a lot of sticky situations. Um, Ezreal also, you know, he has his, his arcane shift, like Ezreal played mid a little bit. Um, I don't know, there's something about when Chovy just locks Zeri in mid in a really risky situation where it feels like he's playing Dan from Street Fighter, you know, that character that, like, nobody plays and is considered very weak. Um, and then he's just, like, kind of like, I'm going to style on you with this, by the way. Like, Zeri's not supposed to win lane, but I will beat you. And then it's a matchup that most people don't know, you know, like that's what happens when somebody like picks Dan in Street Fighter, You're like, oh, that character sucks. Nobody plays that. But then, you know, somebody <laughs> will win with it because they don't know the matchup. They don't know what he does because nobody plays him. Um, and I feel like Chovy, while I, I do think, like I said, in that comp where they had the insane scaling in the front line, like in team fights, that comp absolutely makes sense. But Zeri and Quirky in that one looked like it was going to be a struggle. And then he just wins lane against Faker like it's nothing. Like it's super easy. <laughs> He's like, oh, whatever, Gatlin, got to clear the wave. Kill the minions. I'm I'm in control. Uh, you know, not to say that that was like the most troll that we've seen Gen G, because like you said, there were definitely some other decisions in that BNK series that were made. Uh, but it feels like this team could just do whatever the fuck they want. Like Draven also relatively, you know, exposed, not really having an escape. Uh, long, uh, immobile. That's what I was looking for. Uh, immobile mid lane champion that he's pushing up into turret, and he just trusts that Canyon's got his back. He knows he's got his um his stand aside where he can push people away. He's like, I don't care about a Zach in this game. I can gank me very easily. I don't give a shit. I'm actually just gonna win lane. I'm actually gonna be like 40 CS up in, in 12 minutes. Um, it's just the decisions that Genji are making and the way that Chobi's playing. It just feels like not only do they have incredible fundamentals, they have incredible macro. They're so good at sucking all the, the resources out of the map, getting all the gold, but they also just will dominate you in a way that you don't expect that you've never seen before they will just pick something that when you think about it for a second you're like oh that makes sense but nobody does that and Joby's like i do that i win with that you lose it's i'm over. playing mid draven <laughs> 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 i do love it though i mean the thing is is that gen g they could be really boring and just smash people with the meta wolf but it's like I love seeing Keen play Rise in the Rumble. You know, I like them playing some of these riskier drafts, even if they are a bit troll. But it is also very impressive that in a match that they were kind of comprehensively losing to B- uh, BNK Fear X in game two, that they you see how good they are when they uh, and how impressive they are at controlling objectives when they use one team fight to turn the entire game around to just win instantly. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, they just know how to win League of Legends. <laughs> they see the <laughs> angles, man. It's it's pretty insane. Um, I think we should talk a little bit about D-plus this week, um, the shift gears, right. because uh, their performance against T1, I think, was a little bit shaky. Um, I wasn't really a big fan of Showmaker picking the Silas in that game and doing very little with it and dropping like 17 waves to... Like dropping like two or three waves, but still to try to make an impact and kind of coming up empty. I felt like D plus was cooking a little bit too hard that series. They also couldn't make the twisted fate work. Um, it was a little bit awkward of a game from Showmaker there, a bit of an underperformance. Um, like the MF game in game one was was fine, right? They were able to beat T one in that one. Um, King and having a very good game, and they had a lot of great setup for the MF to to do bullet time things, but. 
D plus, I feel like have this series in particular, like I felt like they were kind of trending downward a little bit, but this series in particular really made me feel like, okay, I definitely favor Hanwha now in terms of the D plus Hanwha hierarchy um, going into mm-hmm. playoffs. Not to say that D plus couldn't beat them in a Was best that before five. or after Hanwha lost to KT? I mean, <laughs> that happened you... the same day, by the way. <laughs> I know, I know. They both teams just disappointed me. I feel like the the KT loss for Hanwha. We'll get was to KT. Little... Don't 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 do that yet. Let's talk about D plus. We'll get there. Um, just just I feel like D plus. We were kind of championing them for playing their own style and being like, oh yeah, we're the team that plays TF. But I think they're going a little bit too deep in it right now. Um, I feel like oh, we're going a little I don't bit... know about that. I mean, I want to credit T1, especially in that third game, because this was a return to the classic like T1 pick composition. I mean, T1's just a team that does very well with setup from Jin. They're the best Jin team in the world. Um, I love seeing Faker on the Ari again. Like when you play Camille, Vi, Ari, Jin, Karma, you are speeding up to get into a position where you can create these picks. And they did a really good job of that. They did a really yeah. good job. I mean, Faker, like, dying in mid lane on Ari, but then the whole team is there, and then Jin is there, like, a cross angle from a super far away, like, the long range he has. Those kind of plays where it looked like D-plus got the jump on them, but actually they they way overextended, and T1 were super good there with the punish. In that game, they had the Camille, they locked down these targets. I thought it was a really good draft from T1, and also they they punished super well. But I think D plus over indexed into having to with the Silas, the Ash, the Ari, uh, sorry, the Silas, the um, Ash, the Sejuani, having to try to get these picks themselves. But their pick comp was kind of inferior to to T1s, and then they were trying to force it into turrets and stuff instead of trying to catch people on the map. I think that both T1 played well, but also D plus really dropped the ball and gave them a lot of opportunities in that game. Sure. Um, I, I'm not not to say that I think like D plus is doomed. It's over, and not to say that I don't want them to continue to try to play like mid TF because they're really good at those types of comps. And I'd rather them do that than just put all the money on aiming and be like hey, he'll get it done because sometimes he does, but the times he doesn't, then um, you lose those every time. Um, when aiming is not performing and you give him all the money, it's just an auto loss. Um, so I'd like to see them continue to try to draft like this, but maybe the Silas was a bit was a bit too too far for me good into the Ari like historically great ult to steal for Silas but I think Guma is like two and five or something like that on the Jin. but I do agree with you like that he is the best Jin in the LCK yeah no they play around it the best by far it's crazy yeah. I was just mentioning the stat because it's like crazy that he, he has such a poor win rate this season but it just doesn't matter because you're still impressed I mean, yeah they're still good um I, all right Wolf, we, we do have to talk about KT. But first, we have one more sponsor for you on today, which is going to be Factor, guys. So check out Factor. Uh, they've got 35 different meals every week and more than 60 add-ons to choose from for your boxes. And what is Factor? They send you never-frozen chef-crafted meals with lots of options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Uh, they're ready in two minutes. All you have to do is, uh, you know, they're, they're covered in plastic wrap. Puncture it so the steam gets out. Chuck them in the microwave for two minutes. Very good. Lots of vegetables, you know, meats, healthy, healthy options. Uh, probably better than your decisions about eating out, you got to say. Uh, so I've been really enjoying Factor when I've been in the States. Uh, it has been really nice to be able to pick it up there. And you can head to factormeals.com slash MontyWolf50 and use code MontyWolf50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code MontyWolf50 at factormeals.com slash MontyWolf50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. So good time to try it out. If you're busy in the fall. Um, and you can, you know, still have healthier options when it comes to, uh, you know, your diet. I, I really wish, Wolf, that I had them here in Korea because I during MSI, I was loving eating that for lunch while I was on stream because I could just walk up, pop it in and it would just be there. And it was yeah. it was a lot healthier than some other choices I could have been making. Yeah, it's 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 really a great way to have that ready for you. You don't have to do meal prep. You can just have that. You can eat it. It's healthier. It's cheaper than than ordering food. Um, oh, for sure. Your house, uh, and it just takes a lot of the weight off of like 
having to pre-plan what you're going to do during that day and then like trying to be like, oh, do I have enough ingredients in my house? I want to make this. Yeah. I want to stay healthy, but I don't have all the stuff I got to go to the store. Nah, don't do that. Or, or making, especially you guys too, who head out to work, like your, your choices are eat out or make yourself the food and take it with you or to eat leftovers, you know? So this is a, a good other option. Plus they have all of the extra add-ons you get. I got like protein shakes and everything like that that were quite good. Um, so yeah, great stuff. So thank you to Factor. Let me now discuss KT with you, Wolf, a team that somehow uh, beat Hanwa and then lost to Breon, a Breon team who was completely out of playoffs, by the way, with nothing on the line. Meanwhile, KT is legit still fighting for a playoff spot. They're in fifth place right now, uh, but Kwangdong's only one game behind them. Like, it is not a sure thing that KT gets on the in the playoffs, and they are losing 0-2 to Breon. What the fuck is this, Wolf? All right, so Peanut is not good at Shivana. We're <laughs> out there. Wolf, Wolf, He's no one Shivana. is good at no one is good at Shivana. I mean, some LPL Shivana... players seem okay at it. Like Croco seems to be good at it. You know, I, I've I've seen some LPL clips. I've been, looking at, I've been I've been searching like we've been hunting far and wide. We got our binoculars out, like trying to find like where's the Shivana happening? Because I can from where I'm saying I can't see the scrims. Like they're just too far away. I can't I can't see those. But I hear, I hear maybe this might be some scrim bucks on the Shivana. But I see I looked across I looked across the ocean. I saw I saw some Chinese Shivana, and I was like, okay. Well, it was Korean Shivana in China, but like, okay, you know, <laughs> uh, it's it's looking like maybe they figured out how to to kind of like poke and and kite and. You know, clean up team fights instead of just engaging. I'm unstoppable. I'm dead. Um, which is like ninety percent of Korean Shivana team fights. Well, well, you know, you know, if Peanut actually had decided, and somebody on my stream when I was reviewing the games pointed this out, Wolf, which is that if Peanut had just literally built tank that game, yeah, KT was playing Nar, Ivern, Corky, Jin, Leona. If Peanut just literally builds armor items they probably win game three hama life but instead yeah. he builds shojin spear of shojin leandries and of course who can forget horizon focus on shivana because he really well, well he really needed to poke people with the z he really needed to shoot his sad little fireballs at them instead of i don't know tanking damage from the no damage composition that kt drafted i i i I don't know what to say except that his decision making on the champ was not great. His accuracy of his ease were not great. Like I literally said this when we were as I was on the uh, analyst desk that day, I said like I don't know about the Shivana pick in game 1. I was like this seems kind of risky and I can't remember who was on the on the desk with me that day, but they were like, "Well, it's a pretty easy champion though." Like uh <laughs> you can't you can't really fuck it up and I was like I was like, "But you definitely it, can, it, by the it way." Basically, <laughs> it basically is just like you hit ease and they were like, yeah. And yeah. I was like, I was like, what if he misses the ease? And they were like, that's not possible. It's like really hard to, it's like really hard to miss. You know, the ease are like really hard to miss. He missed a lot. Like he missed a lot. And we were like watching. I was like, I said, what if he misses the ease? He doesn't hit Sejuani old, so he might not hit these. Uh, and I don't, I don't like to talk, I don't like to talk shit about Peanut because he's actually like one of our best jungle players, and I and I really love him, and I think his pathing is some of the smartest we've ever seen in it's the LCK. Great. I mean, I love Shivana. Shivana, it wasn't it for him. I, I can't. I, it's hard for me to defend it. <laughs> Well, it's I, also I it. it's it's also just that, you know, uh, some of the teams at LCK are now what they're doing now, Wolf, is they're drafting like single primary engage with no non-committal engage. So like non-committal engage would be like an Ash Arrow or a Sejuani where you can do or a Maokai ult, right? You can just kind of chuck these things in there and see if they land. And if they land, you're fine. Leona ult, like for example. But when you draft a composition that is Aatrox, Shivana, Tristana, MF, Alistair, somebody has to go in. That is a committal only engage. And when you build Shivana this way, only Delight can go in. And Delight can only go in when Delight's ult is up. And once Delight goes in, there's no coming back. You know what I mean? And, and also, so he's going into Ivern bushes because yep. it's an Ivern comp. So they don't have vision. They don't know where they're going in, but they're going in. Yeah, it was it was a, it was a bit of a rough one. It's also like you don't need additional damage when you have Aatrox, Tristana, MF. Like you absolutely, I think, can build tank here and have it make sense. 
and you can get into the back line. You can harass the gin, right? But Peanut decides, I mean, half of the ults that Peanut had in this game was him like trying to poke with E, getting poked himself because of Ivern brushes and like Corky rockets are getting rooted by Jin or hit by Jin ult. And then he just has to ult out and he does fucking nothing. Like, it was horrible. And by the way, I think the point was made on this cast that was very funny, which is like Peanut is, he flame horizons Pioshik. He literally has a hundred. Yeah. He has more than Pioshik. He takes all of his fucking camps. He counter jungles the shit out of him. And if he wasn't going to carry this game, what game is he going to carry? Yeah, no, it's... I mean, it's he had three items on Shivana. He, he was able to buy Horizon Focus, as you mentioned, and he just couldn't do anything. Like, he, he wasn't, he wasn't going to do it. Like, he had so much money. This draft just doesn't allow for him to properly carry. You need a bigger front line and, and some other form of engage, potentially, like a top laner that can actually set something up. Like, even Cassante... If they had Cassante in this draft, for example, um, then they could have like used him as a pseudo engage slash frontline, so the Shivana can actually do more of that damage because there's a frontline for her to, to actually step up and hit it. Um, it was kind of a disaster. So I, I look at this as a Hanwa whoopsie more than I, to be honest, look <laughs> at did it lose as a the win. two Shivana games, and and but KT did play well in this series. Like I, the thing about KT, this is why I hate KT guys. It's because they play like this, and then the next game they play like they did against Breon. They, they're just infuriating. The bro game was really bad for KT. Like it was, <laughs> it was actually incredible that they lost with the draft that they had in game two, where they had yeah. the winning lanes. They had Rumble. They had Rumble against Bro. They had a River Shen as well. Yeah, I mean they probably shouldn't have drafted that, but like I still think they, <laughs> it was a winnable draft. Sure. And they, just, they had like, Rumble Vi. That's deft, winnable. Deft drafted Israel. They let Envy have the Braum or uh, Paulo have the Braum Ash, and then Deft was like, "No, I, I got this." And Barrel's like, "No, I'll play. I'll play Recon into this." Uh, which, by the way, pretty tough to play into. And then Deft was like, "No, no, no I go only in these trades." <laughs> and like, <laughs> I mean, they it, got smashed game one. It was a really clean and, game from Brian. Yeah, and I mean. In a very not clean game from KT. Deft has played a ton of Ash games in his career, but you wouldn't know it from how he played in that. Also, what the fuck was the Oriana supposed to do in this draft? <laughs> like, what the fuck was that? He was like, he was like, actually, he was, he was actually like, I'm gonna play Lissandra, and everyone's like, oh, and like, that's a pretty cool pick. Actually, works with their comp. You know, they got the least yeah, set. Like, good, into, got... good into historic like LeBlanc counter. Yeah, yep. good into LeBlanc. They've got the Recon. You know, they've got some good setup for it. Then he was like, nah, Oriana <laughs> locks <it> in. <laughs> and he played like Oriana one or two other times this season where it looked pretty good and like he played well, but it was against weaker opponents. But this in this draft, I'm like, this makes literally no sense. Well, um, you see, you see, Wolf, that he now BDD understands what happens when you tempt fate. Yeah. Um, you get electrocuted. <laughs> yeah, you can use that one on the cast, okay? <laughs> um <laughs> I don't know if, if BD will be playing against Fate any again anytime soon. <laughs> Bro is eliminated <laughs> from playoffs, and uh, that's the end of that. But maybe I'll think of it next year. Um, <laughs> I mean, Pioshik, I guess, was because he was on the lease in, could be a decent ball carrier for Oriana ults. That's it. That's all. Uh, that's all I got. Well, um, so can Rakan. Yeah, I mean, like you, you have you have no. Ability to set up fights and choke points with this draft because you're playing you're playing Lee Sin. You have a, a Cassante, right? But there's a there's an Ash Arrow that can be used to control you in team fights. There's a tough Renekton that's gonna be flanking you, so you kind of always have to be aware of this the fact that the Renekton's gonna be flanking and looking for backline access. So it's hard to actually just control fights and, and put a ball and say you can't walk here because there's other there's there's a Blanc flying around. Like there's just too many angles in this draft for Bro. Bro's draft is very good. Um, and the Orion, I feel like if it was a Lissandra would have been way better. It wasn't. Um, and then the Shin, the Shin game, he, he didn't use his global presence like at all the, during the game. <laughs> I mean, I don't even hate the Shen. Here's the thing, Wolf. Like the Shen with Vi and Kaisa and the backline access and the dive, like, I don't think it's terrible. No, it's good, but you can't like completely mess up the mid game and fall so far especially, behind. Especially irrelevant. when you're playing into Alistair. You know what I mean? Like Beryl likes to cook sometimes and I, I may not like Beryl very much, but I do sometimes like it when he cooks. And, you know, if you're going to play an Alistair that's incredibly weak at level one and try and like shoehorn Shen through a laning phase, it's not bad. 
You know, he's a counter engaged champion and he works, he synergizes very well with these dive comps. I'm kind of into it. Yeah, no, I mean, if you get a big shield onto the Vi, onto the Lucian as he's pushing forward, even onto the Rumble, to be honest, like the Rumble ends up being in the front line, doing a ton of damage with his Q and then you shield him and then he can actually maybe get a second rotation of spells off, depending on how the fight is going. There's a lot of great targets. Kaisa, obviously fantastic. If you can ult the Kaisa, she goes in, you know, you end up putting a shield on her, plus she has her shield from her ult, and then it's difficult to kill her, and she gets a bunch of damage done. Like, I, I do like it, um, but the way it was played was less than ideal. I mean, the Leona was banned. I feel like the Leona would have been the best option otherwise in this draft, um, but it was banned by Bro, so maybe that's why they were like, okay, this is the angle. But they just played very poorly. Like, they looked super uncoordinated, and I think this was KT just going... This is my like my theory, and based on Hirai's anger in the coaching booth uh, that we saw, <laughs> I feel like maybe KT were like, okay, we we beat Hanwa, like let's have fun because it's bro and it doesn't matter. They're not even going to playoffs. Yeah, kind of just it was the bro trap game that we've seen many times in the LCK in the end of the second round robin, where teams just randomly lose to bro. Happened to to Genji. You know, it's happened to a lot of teams where you just you're like, whatever, this is a free win, and the bro were like, though we are still a professional team. Um, that's what we're like, that's debatable, but, you know, they, they beat KT. Um, they beat KT 2-0. It was clean. Uh, I mean, not by KT, but it was like a, a very dominant 2-0 win for Bro. Like, there was not a moment where you're like, oh, maybe K2 comes back here. It just did not look like it. And that's that's rough, because KT are one of the three teams really fighting for playoffs right now. Um, you have Kwangdong, uh, B and K, and KT, the three teams that are, like, fighting. One of these three teams will not make playoffs. Um, so... It's probably going to be Kwangdong, in my opinion. But if KT is dropping games like this, <laughs> maybe it is Kwangdong who goes and then not KT. Um, I mean, KT has a really tough strength of schedule, by the way. They have I mean, Bikor, like Anwa and uh, Genji. I mean, KT though, KT has a really tough strength of schedule. Like, if they lose the next match to Kwangdong, like KT legit might not make playoffs because at that point in time they're tied with Kwangdong in match score and then they have to play Gen G, DRX and D+. Like if they lose 3 out of the next 4 matches, that is pretty crazy. And Kwangdong, if they beat KT, they play BNK, Firex, T1 and then DRX, which DRX is winnable. T1 is winnable. T1 uh, not T1 like lost to, lost to Firex. I don't know, man. <laughs> Look, they're doing the teams are doing the thing again. Kwangdong is allowed to play Tristana again. Yeah, sure, it's nerfed Tristana, but they've got their crutch back under the wolf. I'm getting scared. I mean, I think that that, that they should def teams should definitely just be banning it against. It's it's weak right now compared to what it was. But Bulldog is like undefeated. I think he's either six and zero, seven zero, something like that on the pick. Just don't let him play it. Like he's good I, at it. Dude, I Bulldog was shocked. smart Tristana to be honest. I was shocked. I was shocked when Nongshim just let him have it two games in a row. I mean, Nongshim's drafting. In that series, I mean, we don't even need to talk about Nongshu, but like, it was some of the worst drafting I have ever seen. <laughs> like, their comps made absolutely He's no sense. Eight, Bulldog is eight and zero oh this yeah, season. Eight and zero. Okay. <laughs> He's eight and zero. And by the way, guys, um, considering they are sixteen and seventeen in terms of game score. That means they are eight and seventeen when Bulldog is not on Tristana. So maybe I don't know. Just uh, don't let him play it. <laughs> don't let him play it. Jiwoo, like in that dra in that draft, um, in game two, he was like hovering between the Smolder and the Nila, and like it looked, and then like the last second he swapped to Kaisa. But I was like, do you really think that these are the answers right now? You're like, <laughs> you pick two complete. By the way, when you hover between those two champions that do completely different things for your draft, like they could not be more different, like. Are there two more different AD carries than Neela and Smolder? I don't think so. And he's like, hmm, is this the answer? Or is this the answer? I'm like, neither of them are the answer. Pick the counter, pick Kaisa. I mean, the Smolder would have been better. Awesome. And honestly, like, against Kwangdong, maybe you get the late game. Maybe the Smolder carries anyways. But, like, oh, it hurt me. It hurt me, Monty. Also, I'm just going to point this out. Kuz is now 7-0 and on Nidalee, and he is 5-1 and on Maokai, which means if you let him have Nidalee or Maokai, they are 12-1. and uh, There are certain picks that it is very easy to stop Kwangdong from having, and Kwangdong has almost all of their wins on these picks. Yeah. So to put that in perspective, if Kuz is not on Nidalee or Maokai, they are four and 16. Four and 16. Yeah. 
I mean, if you start looking at some of the numbers on this team, there's very clear picks that they're very good at. Um, and because it's picking up POG on Nidalee and stuff, uh, the problem is if you ban all of those things away, then maybe like the, the Rumble gets through or the Ezreal gets through. Oh, who I think, cares, like, dude? I think, Le- well, I mean, who cares about Rumble? I mean, that champ's like actually the most broken. Like we talk about like Ezreal being broken, Rumble look, is Look, like- Matt, all I'm saying, Wolf, is that it goes all the way through pick and ban and NA without being selected or banned. And, you know, it can't be that good. If LCS won't pick it, it can't be that good. Yeah, well, it was I, nerfed, they, Wolf. They what they are you talking about? Wolf, nerfed. it was nerfed. <laughs> I think um, I'm ready to say it. Like we we were pretty optimistic about him in the early parts of the season. It's just like bull last time around. I feel like Leaper has been pretty underwhelming for me. I think no, that no Leaper's yeah, been fine. No. I think Dude, he's been a little. Max, I, I, said, I, saying, I, I just said underwhelming. Max put him in the oven for three hours, and then was some, then you're like surprised Pikachu when his fucking bot Talia isn't good on standard champs. He's been good. I mean, I think he's been serviceable, but I feel like he's not. When you compare, I think he's not as good as Hannah. Um, you know, for oh, example. Oh God! <laughs> I just, I, I, I think that's true. I mean, Hannah won't play Ezreal for some reason, and that's bad. But I don't, I don't, don't think he's as good as Hannah. Um, and that, that's kind of problematic. I think he's not as good as Deft, obviously. Um, but I think he needs to step it up because Andil, he's stepping it up. Like Andil, he disappeared for a little bit again because that happens. See, Max just like. Puts him in timeout or something, and then he comes back and he's good. Ando looks good. Cuz looks yeah, good. Also, is better. also, are we gonna judge Leaper when his fucking support randomly changes? Like Quantum is way worse than Andil. I don't know about way worse, but definitely worse. Definitely less consistent because he also hasn't played with his team as much as Andil has. So, you know, I, I, I'm not like judging Leaper's two v twos as much as I'm judging his team fights. Um, you know, and I think. He just doesn't have a lot of pro experience yet, so he's been caught a lot. Like, that's the thing for me is he's a streamer, right? He plays a ton of solo queue. He's very highly ranked. But in pro games, people communicate as a five-man unit and track where you are. And if you walk too far forward or you don't have vision somewhere and they know where you are, they will find you and they will kill you. And I think that happens to him a lot just because he hasn't quite gotten used to the LCK environment yet. I mean, I'd say he's not used to it because he's played nearly a full season now. But I think he's not quite... um, integrated yet like he's he's still got some like solo queue tendencies that will eventually go away and i think he has the potential to be a great player don't get me wrong but i think that his earlier performances that i got pretty hyped about and that we were like you know oh, this guy looks really good he's got a wide champion pool you look at the strength of schedule back then maybe we were a little bit misled about how strong of a player he was early and we'll see if he can you know bounce back i don't i'm not saying it's too late like in the season is doomed or anything like that but i'm more interested in seeing how he plays next year than than um and after he's if he stays with the team and after he has like all the off season like cv max boot camp training stuff um how he mm-hmm. does there because uh i think the rest of the team is really looking better right now like there was the slump right the mid-season collapse of kwang Dong. now it's it's going it looks like it's going back up again but I feel like, well, Bulldog, yeah, he got Tristana. He's otherwise looked a little bit better. Cuz, looking much better. It's just Leaper to me. I'm like, oh, he looks basically the same as he did in the slump. That's that's okay when everyone else is doing better, but we'll see if he gets punished. Um, and it was interesting, the, K- the KR side, I ended up talking to the Korean casters a little bit about Leaper, some of them, and um, they were, like, pretty low on him, even when we were high on him. And that made me, like, revisit and look back at some of his games and... Um, they were like, yeah, he just, you know, he's like, you know, he's not that great. So they have to, they have to try to play through Bulldog. And I was like, I think he's okay. They're like, I don't, I don't think so. And then I, I like reviewed it a lot and I'm like, oh yeah, he's not bad, but I think we overhyped him. So I hope he can find his, find his way. Whatever. Well, these are the same people are going to put pays first team all pro. I don't trust their opinion. I <laughs> might also be putting pays first all pro Monty after what happened the last two I- weeks. Oh, <laughs> After, I mean, look, Viper's performances. I've, 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 I mean, like, obviously Hanwa did some some really dumb things, and so like he looked worse as a result. But have you watched Pace's games recently? Boo, boo! Have, what the? Well, if you are, I might be so, doing it. I'm, I haven't decided well, yet. I haven't decided well, yet. There's still two well, weeks of regular you season. Always left. get so hyped up about, dude. You buy the narrative every week so hard the whole season you can't say I, if the season it doesn't matter there's two more weeks it doesn't matter how well pace performs he still has been worse there is no chance for him to recover to be better than viper this split okay but 
I mean, you're a man. Pro, you're a man of the moment, Wolf. No, no, all pro doesn't necessarily have to be based on who is how people performed all season long. It could be based on how they're performing at the end of the season. And I think that um, you know, I'm I'm definitely going to be weighting both very highly. And I haven't decided yet, Monty, but. These past few weeks have been like pushing you me towards days. You are the one railing against this like two weeks ago. I know, ago. but then the <laughs> then the two weeks happened, and now I'm like, well, <laughs> like I, I I was like Viper MVP on this show, right? And then and then I'm like, I watched I watched some of the games that happened, and I'm like, well, that was a bad take. Like it looks like oh, no, you you it wasn't a bad take. It was a good take. It's still a good take. You're just flip flopping. Your your take is bad now. I don't know. I don't know. Monty Payne's just fucking popping <laughs> off. Okay, watch this guy play. Like Viper was popping off on Israel. Now they ban it against him all the time, and he's not looking as good. Maybe he was just a, an Israel abuser. We're all Israel abusers. This metal like, let's be fucking real. Even Envy could be an Israel abuser, but um. I, I, it's a really tough one for me because, I mean, but by the way, like we all know that everyone will vote for Genji and they will get all all first all pro. Like all the Koreans will vote for him. It's already done. So like my vote probably doesn't matter. But I really want to maybe over the next two weeks on this show we can we can start like digging into it a little bit deeper because Wolf has been mind controlled by the Koreans. No, I have to give Maze a chance. No, like, give Maze a chance. Leaper is bad. <laughs> he has first team all pro. He's getting like <laughs> I mean you saw the stats. He has he's the first player. Or the fat, the fastest player to get in terms of games, a thousand kills, faster than Faker. Um, what the fuck? His team is so super good. Yes, and so and so SKT wasn't that good. Okay, come on, Monty. Um, to be fair though, Faker is a mid laner, and it, it pays as an eighty carry. Eighty carries always have more kills, and he lived through Zeri metas, so like those numbers are somewhat inflated. But he's still the youngest player to do it. Um, Dude, there are I'm, just more kills these days than there were in Faker's. I know. Career. I mean, I'm just saying. Like, look, the guy has already got so many achievements. He's super good. He has the kill record for international events. The guy is popping the fuck, and that's not related to LCK, so I'm not going to use that as a reason for voting for him if I do end up voting for him, which I haven't decided yet. But because there's still two weeks of regular season left, Look, it's not I'm going to give him an award. It's called the most overrated player by Koreans of all time. That's what I think. <laughs> so that's my award for him. He's really not saying good, he's not good, guys. Me. I just, he is very good. Uh, it's just the fucking like glazing is ridiculous. I I think Viper and and Hanwha Life they have you know four games left. I think if he has at Look, least if he this has at least motherfucker one... needs to live Teddy's life. Okay, I want him to walk a couple years in Teddy's shoes, and then we'll see how good he is. Yeah, but like Viper's not walking that that life right now either. Like he's he's he on is, the he second. Is, he's always been walking that life. He's, he's on the second like best team in the LCK. He's on the second Viper, best team in the LCK. Jinner was on the second best team in the LCK. Viper, Viper since he won Worlds has always lived. He has been the Teddy. Get, I want I want Pays to be Teddy. That's what I want. <laughs> I mean, I, I I would love to see it. Um, but actually, if you want to see it, you could just go watch him on Genji Challengers. Because that team was horrible, and he popped off there as well. Like, Genji's Challenger team was really bad, and he was actually really good on it, and people were impressed by him. And he was so good on that bad team that Genji wanted to call him up. Like he actually did live that life, albeit in Challengers. But like Genji's Challengers team has pretty consistently been bottom two for most of most of Challengers' ex All existence. Right. I'm just saying he lived it once before. All right, Genji, he went to the best. It's time. It's time. It's time to swap to trade pays for Teddy. Let's fucking go. Let, I, this is the experiment that has to be run. Pays to DRX, Teddy to Gen G. Let's just see how it goes. I'm pretty confident that it'll go fine. <laughs> you think Teddy would just slot in and everything will be the same? Uh, look, the thing about slotting into ruler's position in Gen G is it is like the easiest job because ruler well immense and maybe the best ad carry player of all time he is not a playmaking ad carry a lot of the time he is a very traditional front to back team fighting ad carry and he's incredibly good at it and that makes him very good at his job i love ruler but i'm just saying if you had to call up a player it is as an ad carry it is the easiest position to slot into I, I would tend to agree just simply because you have a team that blocks other people from getting to you and then you do the damage. Like, that's what the position is. You position well, you do the damage. 
I think that Viper has been incredibly impressive in that regard. He walks a fine line on Israel. That's why I was saying, like, I want this guy for MVP. Like, he was leading the front front runner for me. A lot of people were, were saying, no, Pays is better to me back then. And then these last, you know, few weeks, especially this week, I'm watching Pays, and I'm like, damn, well, this is actually incredible what he's doing. Um, and then Viper has disappointed me a little bit more. Viper's Ezreal, in particular, his Zeri, these are the two picks that I've been really enamored with how he plays, because on both the Ezreal where he's poking people and then standing really close to them and then threatening to, to E back if they want to go in and then his team is ready to collapse, that kind of play where his team is behind, but he hits so much poke that it actually looks playable. Those kind of moments, that's where I'm like, holy shit, Viper is so smart, so accurate, has such a great game sense. And he is not just, like you say, sitting behind his team and doing damage. He's actually in the front as Ezreal, pushing the advantage, pushing people, poking people. Um, and then you look at Zeri and how he's able to control team fights with that. He knows exactly when to old. He plays pretty slow, uses his poke on his extendo beam to, like I said, similarly to the Ezreal, threaten the enemy team, try to figure out what their their, their game read is going to be on that team fight. Then goes in perfectly, has his teammates to back him up, obviously. I look at Pays though. And Pays is just insane in the 2v2s. They have insane amount of duo kills. I don't have the number in front of me right now, but I imagine it's probably the highest in the LCK. Killing people 2v2 nonstop, even sometimes in unfavorable matchups. Um, Pays has, you know, otherwise had fantastic team fights, great reads on um, all ins in the mid lane. He's just, he's done everything well, too. Like, Viper, I think Viper and Pays are two different players. Like, I agree with what you're saying that Viper gets it done alone more. But I feel like Pays for what his team is and the, how strong they are. Like, I feel like almost only Pays could actually just get like a million billion kills in the game with the position his team has given him. You know, like a lot of the 80 carries, I feel like weaker 80 carries wouldn't do as well as Pays because they they would just be like sitting back farming while the team was was actually just winning the game. You know, I feel like Pays is willing to sacrifice a lot to make sure he can set his team up for success as well. And they're very different players and they do very different things. And it's a tough call for me. I'm 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 still keeping Pays open. Be. Wolf's gonna flip flop back after this next week when Viper dumpsters DRX and Breon. You just wait. You well, as it turns wait. out, like your current four matters a lot, Monty. I'm not gonna be like, <laughs> you know what? I think this player is better because he was better two weeks ago. No, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't <laughs> matter. It's an MVP of the season, not of last week. I mean, MVP and for MVP, I, I will be talking about the entirety of the season, absolutely. But for all pro, it's like, well, I mean, at the end of this, at what the end of the day, you want the thing. Them. It's just MVP of each position. I mean, oh, oh, it's is aren't isn't the idea of all pro though that you would put the best team together from every position? I suppose right? you could make that argument, but I would just say it's the best player at every position for the whole season. Because like I think that's part of why I think the Korean side thinks like it'd be the best team possible no matter what, and it's like, well, it's the team that won because they're like, well, that's the best team because they won, and like that's not how I really look at it. But I think so outrageous. <laughs> but I think some people look at it that way. Um, I don't know what you guys, you guys should let us know in the comments what you think all pro means. Like, should it just be the best player in each position or should it be the best also, team? Also, Boo Wolf for his ridiculous flip-flopping. Oh, they will. <laughs> they already told me last week, that, like, Wolf is so recency biased. It's almost as if he just did a week of LCK and they came down the show and he was like, this is what happened in the LCK last week. It's almost as if, like, he's like, isn't Monty and Wolf about talking about what happened in the LCK last week? Like, he's only oh, talks about what was going on recently in the LCK. <laughs> And especially the, the day before Sunday, the day that he just did that he has the best memory of. I can't believe Wolf would, would wait that his experience <laughs> he has in his mind more fresh, higher than he would. I, don't know. Um, I think, I think these day. conversations are fun. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we let's talk about this coming week. Uh, we do we do have some. Let's talk about the most interesting matchups. Uh, Gen G versus KT. Who the fuck knows what's going to happen in that one, right? D plus versus Fear X. Maybe you know something what? interesting. I don't Kwang, think... Kwang Dong's match is very important. Like, actually, Kwang Dong versus KT and Fear X versus Kwang Dong could actually determine who's in playoffs. So those matches, while being mid-table matches, are really important ones. Yeah. I feel like if you... If, like, KT beats Kwang Dong, but then Kwang Dong beats BNK, that's, like, really bad for BNK because the three of them are vying for playoffs, right? And yep. then, uh, obviously, one of them will be eliminated, so... And Kwang Dong has a better uh, map score than... Yes. Than Firex. They're minus one right now. They're 16 and 17 in terms of games, where Firex is 14 and 17. So that could actually be the determining factor between like sixth and seventh place. KT Genji is really interesting because of the the kind of weird mystery around KT's uh overperformances, underperformances. Genji losing to them in spring, for example, was 
you know, partially related to them having two Senna games and Senna all this was good, you know, not only very strong, but teams didn't really know how to play around it at that point. Uh, I think Genji will beat KT 2-0, and not just because they lost to Bro, but I just think the KT got a little bit lucky against Hanwa, and they overall just are not the stronger team right now. And I don't think there's any pick that KT is going to bring out that will surprise Genji. Like, Genji is going to ban Ivern. Because that's what KT is winning with a lot of the time, is just putting Pioshik on Ivern. I think Genji will ban it. They won't let them have Rumble. <laughs> so I'm I'm heavily leaning towards Genji, but I think that series will be interesting um, for, for the kind of reasons you mentioned. Hanwa has a very easy week, so I'm expecting them to just cruise through. Um, same with D+. They have Nongshim, they have BNK. BNK could be a, a trap game for D+. They might, you know, that might seem like an easier matchup and they could falter there. For BNK, you need to win that D plus series, I think. Ideally, if you want to guarantee yourself a spot in playoffs, it's not doomed. But then if you don't win that one, you know, you likely have to beat either T1 um, or Hanwha Life. So it's it's a really tough schedule for them. Uh, I think I misspoke earlier when I said they had Genji. They have D plus Hanwha Life uh, and T1 and then the Kwangdong series. So four really tough opponents if Kwangdong plays well. Uh, BNK look like... Because of their strength of schedule being weaker, they look like, oh, they're coming back a little bit, but we'll see what happens when, when shit really hits the fan in these next two weeks. Very good. Yes, we are in the race for playoffs. Um, you know, Genji and Hanwa have qualified for playoffs, but um, they're like Hanwa is not locked into their position. Genji is locked into a playoffs buy so they're they're guaranteed top two at this point in time but the field is very much open otherwise so it is at least a tight race towards the end to see which teams are going to get in playoffs so we'll be talking more about that next week see you guys then